What if I told you that one of the first abolitionists in the United States and in England was a hunchback, vegan, Quaker dwarf who lived in a cave? Sounds a little far-fetched and contrived, I know, but Benjamin Lay, the irrepressible prophet, was as real as any man who ever lived. My screenplay that I'd like to pitch to you today is an epic historical drama. It takes place in Great Britain, the Mediterranean, Barbados, and in colonial Pennsylvania. I'd like to quickly tell you the story. Now, Benjamin Lay was born in Colchester, England in 1689, and though apprenticed to be a glover, he set out to sea when he came of age and he traveled throughout the Mediterranean lands and the Caribbean. Now, while at sea and while traveling through the Middle East, he encountered numerous accounts of the barbarianism of slavery, up close and very, very personal. Now, while at the same time, he discovered the diversity of, of different types of people and cultures and thus became transfixed on the subject of humanity and slavery. Sarah, the wife he took, was also a dwarf. She traveled as a minister throughout England and Ireland and Scotland, but together they relocated to Barbados where she and Benjamin encountered atrocities of slavery that affected both of them for the rest of their lives. And it was here in Barbados that Lay was inspired to dedicate the rest of his life to preaching against the practice of slave keeping by the hypocritical Quakers, the ministers, and the elders. While living in Barbados, Richard Parrott, a cooper, who I knew. He used to whip his Negroes every second day morning, very severely to keep them in awe. Now it was usual for these miserable slaves to gather together to bewail and lament their forlorn condition one to another. One says, my master, very bad man. Another says, my mistress, very bad woman. But this parrot's negro, a lusty fellow, a cooper, he says, my master parrot, very bad man indeed. He whip, whip, poor negro, every Monday morning for nothing at all. And so he hangs himself on first day at night because he would not be whip Monday morning. Now it wasn't long before Benjamin and Sarah were forced to leave Barbados. This was due to certain slave uprisings that Benjamin and Sarah may or may not have had anything to do with. So, settling in Philadelphia and excited to be a part of William Penn's holy experiment, the two began a new life in, in, in hopes of raising a family and settling down. But this did not go as planned. You see, Lay's obsession with, with the evils of slave keeping and his preoccupation with these Quaker ministers and elders who owned the slaves or had any kind of dealings with slaves, he caused such a ruckus that he and Sarah were, were, were subjected to continuous harassment by the weighty Quakers who tried their best to separate the two and, and force them out of the society altogether. Well. Sarah managed to slip by because she was a nice lady, but when Benjamin is disowned by the Quakers, he begins an onslaught of theatrical protests against both the practice of slavery and of the society's stance on the subject. And then Sarah Lay suddenly dies. Benjamin relocates to this cave near Abington, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. And in, in his innermost cave, in his grieving state of mind, he writes this fiery manifesto condemning slavery by the Quakers, by the Protestants, the Catholics, and all religions. 
His book is published by Philadelphia printer Benjamin Franklin, who goes on to become one of Lay's closest friends and confidants. In the book, Lay challenges what he sees as hypocritical ministers and Quakers throughout the New World. Part of his method for getting to these guys is he would barge into the churches and, and the meeting houses and disrupt, disrupt the sermons. Uh, he publicly calls out the ministers, causing them great embarrassment. And in most cases, he's violently discharged to the street outside. Benjamin Lay spends his entire life fighting the establishment. And in doing so, he endures that painful rejection from the society and, and from others around Philadelphia. But he's relentless and he's fearless and irrepressible in his struggle. I walked into the solemn Burlington meeting house with a sword and a great book. And I stepped up onto the rostrum and then exclaimed, Oh, all ye Negro masters, who are contentedly holding their fellow creatures in a state of slavery, well knowing the cruel sufferings these innocent captives suffer in their current state of bondage, both here in the North American colonies and in the West India Islands, you must know they are not made slaves by any direct law, but are held by an arbitrary and self-interested custom in which you participate some of the weighty Quakers, ministers who owned slaves, did not like what I was saying, so I directed my sermon straight at them. And to you who profess to do unto all men as ye would they should do unto you, and yet in direct opposition to every principle of reason, humanity, and religion, you are forcibly containing your fellow men from one generation to another in an unconditional generation of servitude. You may as well throw off the plain coat as I do. And it was here that I threw off my coat and dressed in an officer's war uniform. I continued amidst their gasps and protests. It would be as justifiable in the sight of the Almighty who regards all nations and men of color with equal regard that you should thrust your sword through their hearts as I do through this book. And it was here that I pierced the bladder of pokeberry juice I had hidden within my book and sprayed it over those seated near me. You should have seen the look on their faces. Disowned, denounced by the Quaker community that he loved more than anything, Lay's message didn't fall on deaf ears. Thanks to his devotion and his stubbornness and his persistence, his message was accepted by a whole new generation of young Quakers who went on to realize Lay's goal, including Anthony Benezet and the legendary John Woolman, who as a young boy, Witness Lay pierced the book with a sword in Burlington, New Jersey. Lay's legacy inspired one man after another, until finally English politician William Wilberforce indirectly carried the torch to Parliament and 20 years later, the Slave Trade Act of 1807 was passed. One little man, one giant quest, Benjamin Lay is a hero for every generation to admire and to imitate. By 1761, just a few years after his death, Quakers on both sides of the Atlantic were forbidden from owning slaves. And they remembered that eccentric little man who helped set them on the path by placing his picture in a frame and hanging it on the wall. It was hard to come by a Quaker family anywhere in America who did not own that portrait. Benjamin Lay was one of the first to promote the equality between men and women. He was one of the first to criticize the prison system for its carelessness with its prisoners and one of the first to speak out against capital punishment. This historical drama spans 80 years, four continents. It is packed with epic adventures at sea, land, 
stories of unforgettable friendships and betrayals, passion, persistence. My screenplay is written in a non-linear narrative format. It will be available as a feature-length film or a 10-episode series. Benjamin Lay, The Irrepressible Prophet, is now available for your consideration. Thank you.